I just want to welcome my good friend, uh, Julian, to the show. Um, Julian is an indigenous human rights lawyer and writer from Guam, uh, where he's calling me from right now. Um, he's also a founder of Blue Ocean Law, uh, which is a boutique international law firm uh, that works across Oceania in, at the intersection of indigenous rights and environmental justice. Um, he's also a lover of the sea and people with sea secrets in their eyes. <laughs> and he lives in Yona, Guam. Um, but Julian is also more than all of those things. Um, today, we're going to be talking a little bit about his uh, most recent book, which is being republished um, uh, in, you know, the, the news is coming out as the podcast is coming out. So we don't have to like um, backdate anything or update anything. But his book, The Properties of Perpetual Light, um, is an amazing kind of testimony to a variety of things. It's not just a book of poetry. It's not just a book of memoir. It's kind of a collection of historical documents of speeches um, that he's given over the years at law schools that he's graduated from and also speaking to his own people uh, on the island of Guam, young people high, graduating from high school. It's quite a it's quite an interesting read, uh, to be honest. It's kind of it, it seems like incoherent when you talk about it that way. But in fact, there's very much a through line through the entire thing. And it actually reads from cover to cover like a complete work. And so I just really enjoyed rereading it again um, today. Um, but welcome to the podcast, Julian. And I don't know if I gave a proper introduction, if there's something I missed. No, that sounds great. Um, the, you know, the book in some ways is like a hot mess, but I mean, it works, you know, I, it's definitely more than anything else. I say in the introduction that I think what connects the various pieces in the book is not the subject matter, but the spirit. And I mm. call it a spirit of insistence, you know, just the insisting on life, no matter the hour, even at the hour of death. Um, so I think those are the pieces, I mean, you know, that's sort of the through line, I would say. Yeah, and you even talk about how, uh, I think in one of the the, pe the, the pieces, you talk about how, um, you know, for, for you, uh, returning back home to Guam is almost like, um, you know, going to a funeral in many ways. And, you know, you talk about dying a lot in, in this book, but also it's like you said, it's about... It's a book about life and the continuation of life, despite all of the, you know, circumstances of colonization and imperialism and militarism. Yeah, um, you know, and in, in some ways, <clears throat> the story here is, you know, the story elsewhere, you know, just the story of indigenous peoples around the world who, you know, are doing our best to wrap our arms around what matters the most, you know, our loved ones, you know, um, and we tried to operate with, you know, a worldview that we hold so you know, it's singular, but it's also shared, you know, by indigenous peoples the world over. And that is, you know, having respect for each other and for the earth. Um, and so that's, in, you know, in some ways, that's what the book is about. And the book is interesting in that it's kind of like I refuse to choose between genres or anything. I kind of just celebrate all of it and ha have all kinds of different things in there. And I think in some ways, that's what confronting empire looks like, you know, it's like, it looks like people who are always in some ways out of step, because you know, like that's, you have to think on your feet, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> when you're up against empire and empire is always changing and conniving and clever and quick, you know, and so we have to be, you know, constantly, you know, lurching from one situation to another. Um, and so, you know, that um, as activist scholars and writers, this is what we do, you know. So but I thought I would try to celebrate the different forms, you know, and not really make it one thing or another. Yeah. And as much as this book is, you know, very much moving and inspiring, it's also very informative because, you know, you are a lawyer. And so uh, but before we get into that. Um, let's, uh, let's have you read, um, the piece, um, Go With The Moon. Sure. <clears throat> Go With The Moon, my godfather says. He's a talizeru, meaning he throws net and he knows things. Like what time of year the Minyahawk run, which is the actual question I asked. Seriously, Nino, I say, seriously, he says. You get your gear ready in April because that's the first run. Late April into early May. You get seven days, maybe 10, but that's it. So you got to be ready. Then he self-corrects. Tells me those months don't matter. Not really anyway. Tells me for the second time that what matters is the moon. 
the last quarter moon, the real thin one, that's the one we want, he says, his voice trailing, his eyes fixed on a grayish blob moving in the distance. I don't ask any more questions. Just watch. Watch the gray blob, which is really a school of baby rabbit fish, come into focus. Watch a quiet man grow even more quiet. Watch a white net spread itself out like a circular dream and drop. And I am in awe. Never, ever have I seen something so quiet be so alive. You know, one of the kind of themes of this book that I noticed is this idea of quietness and, and stillness. And, you know, the, you have this saying in there that kind of really stuck out to me. It's like when the world is chaotic, um, maybe you have to turn to being quiet for a while. And it kind of seems very opposite of uh, what kind of the Western world kind of teaches us to be loud and, you know, uh, kind of more, I mean, to meet chaos with chaos, so to speak. And um, can you explain a little bit, because this, the, the piece you just read is very much a meditation on um, stillness and quietness and, and observation. So maybe you can talk a little bit about what you mean by being quiet. I mean, like, for example, last year, 2021, um, in, in so many ways, it was a year where all of the Amer American Empire's chickens came home to roost at once, mm -hmm. you know, and like in a Guam, it, it, it was just a just a shit show. I mean, it was it was 500 years of colonization meeting accelerated militarization in the form of like daily reminders of our political dispossession. Like we, we in Guam were m reminded of our sort of colonized political status every single day. Um, for example, um, the USS Theodore Roosevelt had, you know, thousands of, you know, sick um, sailors and they had to come and dock and then they stayed in the local hotels. They infected the local community. Um, the U.S. military officials refused to be transparent, turn over any information, thereby exacerbating the spread of, of the virus in Guam. It was just all kinds of things, you know, and the, and the military sort of in the background, in the background, the military is like, rapidly militarizing our homeland here you know they are building the first marine corps base since not built since 1952 you know it's a, a huge um, marine corps base they're transferring thousands of troops from okinawa all of this stuff and so what i mean is all of that is so loud you know both empires sort of shenanigans and the confrontation to empire all of that so we are lawyers and activists we were on the streets we were protesting we were filing petitions we were lobbying lawmakers and we were filing lawsuits you know it's like we're just that's what i mean about being sort of like locked in this like in this terrible game of lurching from one crisis to another you know and that's what i wanted to break with the book when i was writing i was like i have to find a way to communicate the harms of the imperial project here on Guam. And the only way really to reach people is to get them quiet. Does that, does that make sense? So like I had, I wanted to write a book that was quiet. So the reader almost physically has to lean in and listen, you know, and we don't do that. I mean, at least uh, indigenous peoples do, but many, many other peoples do not listen. I um, mean, you know, and that's partly what we're doing here now. I mean, I believe that the most important work that one can do now is the work of radical listening, which I, mm. I, I describe in the book as the work of listening to those who are more vulnerable than you, you know, whose lives are in are more precarious than our own, you know, and I think that the clearest example is not just people, but all of our sort of other than human relatives. On Guam, that's what we're listening to. We're listening to our endemic Mariana Eighth Pup Butterfly, whose limestone forest home, home is being raised for a 59 acre multi-purpose machine gun range. You know, that, you know, and there's also at sea, you know, the U.S. is militarizing a section of the ocean off the coast of Guam, roughly the size of India, if you count it all up. India, like this is how wide a swath of the Pacific Ocean the U.S. is militarizing at this moment um, under the Marianas Islands training uh, range, the MIT, they call it, and the Merck. But in this, pro like, and so now you have like even the, basically the basic the federal agencies like NOAA sort of allowing, you know, giving take permits to the U.S. military to take like 150 
mother calf pairs, you know, of humpback whales, 75 mothers, 75 calves a year. And it's like, we have to start listening to all of the sort of the whole range of life, you know, all of our relatives everywhere they are, um, you know, and they are in a very precarious place. They're in danger. And like, we have to get quiet and, the, and listen to, listen to all of that, you know, because there, that is sort of what gives us hope. And that's what feeds us, you know, the need to protect all of these relatives. I mean, this is, this is why, you know, we, you know, some people write this off in academic circles, but this is why we are comfortable using the word love mm. because this is about love. Only love can save this place. How many indigenous communities have said that and are saying that, you know, obviously or being organized as hell, you know, mass mobilization being, you know, like all of that is very important, but like we don't shy away from that word because it's resonant. Hmm. Yeah. You know, you, um, it, that just the way you were framing this reminded me of something I've been reflecting on recently is that, um, like when I'm with my father, for example, my dad will speak to me you know first of all he doesn't call me by my first name he calls me son um but also he will speak to me in a way that's so quiet like that you nobody else can hear him and he he will get like frustrated with me if i ask him to repeat himself you know because he's like you know this you speak to each other in a way where it's like it requires active listening you know and um whereas you know like <laughs> i think twitter or you know, our current media landscape is not really about so much um, active listening as it is about kind of gaining somebody's attention by, you know, publicizing something that's wild, you know, wildly like sensational in many ways, which can be effective. And I, I was thinking about as you were talking about, you know, just th that there's this new movie called Don't Look Up, um, which, you know, the opening scene is about this telescope which i believe is the subaru telescope which is sitting on to atop mauna kea which is a sacred site to uh, indigenous people the kanaka maoli or relatives in the pacific and how it's about this you know trying to make as much noise about climate change as possible but never really interrogating atop this place of meditation and deep reverence why is it that you know, the astronomy industry had to destroy a sacred site or defile a sacred site of indigenous people just to understand, you know, had to destroy worlds to essentially save its own and discover more about its own. And it kind of really, I was like, here's a missed opportunity <laughs> for you all to interrogate what's really going on in this world. But, um, you know, I was just, I, I just, that was just kind of a quick reflection of what you were saying. And, you know, after reading this book, but also, there are several things that also happen, like COP26, you wrote an amazing piece uh, for The Atlantic, you know, uh, that's called um, To Hell With Drowning uh, during, I think, the first week of COP26 um, came out in November of last year. Um, but you should uh, maybe you can give us an idea of what you were talking about in that in that particular piece, because you, you, you know, highlight some of the themes in this book where it's like, why is it that, you know, the people who are the least responsible for climate change are suffering from the most deleterious effects of it. And not only that, you have an institution such as the US military, which is emitting more than 100, emitting more greenhouse gases than 130 nations in, in the world combined, you know? And it's not even present, like not only are island nations largely disregarded, you know, from these big climate talks, but nobody's allowed to even talk about militaries. They're not even in, they're not, they're like off the table in these discussions. Yeah. Um, so in that, I agree with everything you're saying, but in that piece in particular, you know, um, it's, yeah, you're right. It's, it's sort of along the same lines in a way, maybe like I'm kind of trying to push this theme, you know, I kind of think like, this is the easiest way to explain it. I was trying to argue that Climate change is the fight of our lives, but we will not win by way of facts. Mm. We might by way of stories, you know, because mm. there are two kinds of information. You know, there's information that merely informs and then there's information that compels, you know, that uplifts. And it, it does so much more work, you know, the latter. So that is what I'm trying to do. I mean, what so many of us who are engaged in really rigorous storytelling are trying to do. I mean, in some ways, this is how it always looks, you know, like 
on a superficial level, like even the protests against the Dakota Access Pipeline or the Mauna Kea TMT or the massive firing range in Retidian and Guam, uh, in some ways, in some ways, we're still locked. At least the outside likes and the dominant media likes to lock it in being against something. Right? It's it's mm-hmm. just an entirely oppositional story, right? But really, if you really hear what's happening, we, we're arguing for something, right? We're arguing mm-hmm. for better relations with the Earth, with each other. We're against you know resource like endless you know extractivism, you know, all of, all of these things. But I think when you really come down, it's like a paradigm war, you know, like we are telling very different stories. And these stories really boil down to what does it mean to be human in a warming world? What does it mean to be, get, what, it, what does it mean to be human on the planet? We have such spectacularly different versions of what it is, what it means to be, you know, a human being. And for us, for indigenous people, it's about being a good relative. I mean, this is why I love the red deal your your folks's book that come out and i read it and bought some copies for other people because it's great because it's so clear-eyed perhaps more than it, it's such a short book but i the reason why i love it so much is because it it just it hedges no bets it is like supreme clarity about so many issues and i was like and it's written with that sure-handedness and i think indigenous peoples we are taking our place all over the world with a sure-handedness in our storytelling and that's what i tried to do i tried to lay it down you know in that article and be like this is an essay about climate change from the perspective of those on on you know, in Oceania's front lines, you know, the, mm-hmm. from the perspectives of those who are really feeling the effects of climate change. And I have an entry in the book where I sort of talk, I try to get at that as well, you know, trying to say that we will fight for you know, climate justice and we are fighting for climate justice, but with an entirely different perspective, you know, a, a set of intellectual commitments, you know, a, a political agenda that just doesn't match you know what, like so many other groups who are also fighting for climate justice, they're telling a very different story still. And we mm-hmm. see it even now with the greenwashing and even now with the resources, re- renewable resources that always see it. We see this game and it's a game and it's a foot. But this game is a very old. It's been a foot for so long. So we kind of know better now. Like we, we see that really clearly and we kind of have to refuse to give in to like sort of some, some of our most central assumptions about what it means to be a human on the planet. And that's what I was trying to do in the piece, you know, and trying to really honor and amplify the perspectives of the most vulnerable. Mm. Yeah, 100%. And I think, you know, for us, like in our kind of epistemology and, you know, cosmology, um, for human beings, like human beings are exceptional only because, not because we are superior, you know, in the Lakota way of viewing things, to all other life, it's because we are 100%, we're the only species that is entirely dependent on all other life. Whereas like, you know, the birds don't necessarily need need us. Animals, the plants don't necessarily need us, right? But we need all of those things. And so that puts us in a kind of a, 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 a special, like a special position where we have to, like what makes us unique as human beings is not, you know, an opposable thumb. It's not, you know, this idea of a, a massive brain or whatever. It's the fact that we are so dependent on the rest of life that we as human beings, uh, as Ikche Wichash, as common people, have to constantly be in communication in relation with the rest of the world for our, our bare survival, right? Period. It's like, yeah, sure. It There is, you know, there is kind of deeper esoteric spiritual connections but at the end of the day, it's like we have to survive as a, as a species and as, you know, um, as relatives. And so it makes sense to have those relations, whereas, you know, it's completely opposite in, in the kind of Western framework of science and, and where humans are like at the top. They're the apotheosis of life itself versus ours is an inverted triangle, where it's just like we're the bottom, like we're the we're the most destructive species. And I, you know, I would attribute that to all human beings, obviously a certain class of human beings called capitalists uh, and imperialists. But um, nonetheless, like we have the arrogance to say, or some people have the arrogance to say that we are the most, you know, we are the prime species. And, you know, like what you're saying here is like, I think is, is just very, a very beautiful way to kind of recenter ourselves and to uh, act with humility, you know, uh, and act with, um, a sense of urgency while also understanding, as you point out, 
that this isn't just like fast breaking news. This is like slow, uh, long, you know, histories of indigenous that have been unfolding over time, both the colonization of these places uh, and the destruction of these environments and territories and life worlds, as well as the preservation and resistance of, of those places as well. And so I, I really appreciate that. Maybe you can like walk us back a little bit to kind of the two, I would say like there's like two histories of Guam and I want to get to this case because um, you, you, you mentioned it, you, you, you do this kind of essay where you're like driving and thinking about, um, let me find the case here. I wrote it down and I can't find it. Um, oh, the uh, Davis, yeah, the Davis v. Guam case, because it's like there's two versions of Guam, right, that you're talking about. And you as a lawyer know more, more so than ever, you have the Guam of the Chamorro people, and then you have the Guam of the United States. And maybe we can begin there. Like, what is what is the Guam of, of the, the, the Chamorro people? And then what became of Guam, according to the United States? Sure. I mean, well, Guam is our ancestral homeland, you know. It's the homeland of the Chamorro people. We've been here for thousands of years. Um, and not just Guam. I mean, Guam, um, the Chamorro people inhabit the entire archipelago, the Mariana Islands, right? So it's also, so it historically, our islands were divided. So Guam... Um, uh, you know, it's the largest and southernmost island in that archipelago, but all the other northerns were politically organized under the rubric of the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. But now, fast forward through many fits and starts to our history, they're also a U.S. territory, you know. They tried to bargain in the 70s for a status that was actually more autonomous, etc., but clearly that didn't shake out the way so many even of the negotiators thought it would. I mean, the U.S. has really sort of just treated it as it's just a colony, and that that's the simplest way to put it is that just to be really clear about the, the, the language, you know, we're not using colony in a, any sort of um, metaphorical sense. Guam is an actual colony, meaning the United Nations, the international community recognizes Guam officially as a colony of the United States. Um, the language that the UN uses to describe Guam is a non-self-governing territory, you know, so me meaning we have a prima facie case established. We don't have to argue that we have a right to decolonization because it's like, you know, like this is what this remedy is for. Um, so that, but, you know, to the U.S., it's much simpler, you know, it's a strategic military outpost. I mean, it is, mm -hmm. you know, and now with all of the sort of drummed up sort of, you know, war going rhetoric around China, you know, and containing China. I mean, and we saw this clearly um, in, in just set, like every single administration. I mean, this probably uh, what, you know, this probably was really stamped in during the Obama years um, under the rubric mm. of the Pacific pivot or the Asia Pacific yeah. pivot, sometimes it's called. But essentially this this idea that, the, like even Hillary Clinton, I remember in 2011, went to Hawaii at the East West Center and ominously announced that this is in every single way conceivable, America's Pacific century. You know, so what this means is like, it's like that the US will project its power from here. It will contain China's rise from here. I mean, the containment, I mean, all of this you see with the brand new release global posture review you see it with like with this massive budget you know that the congress keeps um just feeding the war machine you know that's why i always say let's go back to the original version call it the what is it the military industrial congressional complex because yeah. congress is absolutely right in there with them you know just cooking up in this terrible sordid kitchen you know all these sort of monstrous dishes i mean they're all doing it together I mean, and, and and now, I mean, you know, now in 2022, like we see it all, like all of these sort of dreams of, of the, the imperialists are really have come, you know, are fully formed. I mean, we have a brand new Marine Corps base. We have tro additional troops being sent to Guam. They're beefing up military presence in Australia. We have AUKUS now, you know, we had Qua, I mean, AUKUS, we have so, so, so many things, you know, and it's, and it's so sad if you take a long view because, right, the troops just left Afghanistan. Now it's China. It's like, it's just, we are so naive to think that it's it's almost like this um aberration when it's absolutely a system that is working perfectly well because this is what the system was created to do you know and so that's why that is the guam of in the u.s imagination you know it's where america's day begins it's the tip of the spear it's the place you know but honestly if you really sort of 
you know, if you know your history, you also know that, you know, all this sort of pretend, all this make-believe about defending Guam, you know, the U.S. is sort of, uh, the rhetoric it uses to justify this huge, enormous budget, you know, and the, and the huge, un, un, just obscene amounts of money that are being spent to militarize Guam and to defend Guam. But actually, if you really look at history, like the U.S. also left, also knew that Japan was about to bomb Guam and left. They loaded all of their U.S. military personnel and some of their dependents onto a ship, a ship that had like splashed the word Aloha on it. And they, they went away, which is like, it, Guam also like, there's so many connections, you know, like it's just the way the U.S. Um, sort of imperial imagination works. It doesn't even have an ability to understand which island it's on. It's all the same, you know, Aloha is the same. So it's just, it's all part of it, you know, it's because it's, we are all lumped into this other. And we have all been in this otherness, I mean, for a long time, but clearly since... 1898, America's imperial meridian, you know, when the U.S. decided to make a go of it, you know, the classic colonial game, you know, imperial game of collecting overseas colonies, you know, and running that, you know, forever. I mean, and we still have the legacy of it now. We have the insular cases, which have never been overturned. We see that in federal Indian law with the doctrine of discovery ever since, you know, the Cherokee cases, the Marshall Trilogy case. I mean, like we can go on and, you know, there's so many ways and it's a game in some ways. That, that's why, like, for me, when, I, when I'm when i teaching, I'm also, like, a part-time law professor, but rarely these days. Like, I actually love, like, I, I would love to teach federal Indian law more just because mm -hmm. that is such a perfect body of law because it just, it, it robs you of any illusion about what's mm -hmm. happening here. You know what I mean? The, these legal fictions that are born of thin air that are used, you know, as cons to provide constitutional cover to all kinds of imperial games, you know, that's, it's exactly the same. I mean, they function toward the exact same end, the, the, the doctrine of discovery and the territorial incorporation doctrine born of the insular cases. It's, we're, we're locked in it together. I mean, even now with this whole political versus racial binary, you know, yes. like it will be morning versus Mankari, Rice versus Cayetano. I can go on, but this is boring. But I mean, you know what I'm saying, right? No, like, no, no. But yeah. maybe, maybe you can break down the case, the, the um, Davis v. Guam case, because I, I think it resonates with, some of the, uh, it resonates with the Bracken v. Uh, Holland Supreme Court case that's going through, you know, the docket right now. Um, but maybe you can break it down because I think it's important because it, and it's not, to, yeah, you yeah. break it. You're the lawyer. You're the expert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, break it down for us. Yeah. Well, basically, basically, Nick, in 2011, um, a retired um, a U.S. Military, military personnel member who had moved to Guam and then, you know, like Guam or whatever, decided to stay, um, had sued the government of Guam for violations of the 15th Amendment, the right to vote, you know, equal protection, um, the 14th Amendment, um, and the Guam's Organic Act, as well as the Voting Rights Act, right? So we have this, like, case where, just like in Hawaii, all of these sort of, like, reconstruction of era amendments, you know, are now being weaponized and deployed actually, again, you know, in service of people who historically never needed its protection. You know, so like it was a white plaintiff who benefited from Rice's versus Cayetano, you know, from the 15th Amendment. It's just it's really mind blowing when you really think about it, you know, I mean, I'm like so like any of you trace it. It's not just legally. It's the political narrative that accompanies the legal the cases. For example, Breitbart came out in support of this case, you know, like accusing Guam of being the new Jim Crow. Like, like it was so it was like the fallacy of false equivalence, like like white is the new black. You know, and it's all the same. We have no historical memory. We don't understand that at the at the heart of these reconstruction amendments is a, is a is a beating heart of anti subordination. That's its animating principle. That's its justification. You know, and now we have these reconstruction amendments being used against indigenous peoples who fall outside of the very narrow category provided by Morton versus Macari. That's um, basically the political classification doctrine. Essentially, when a legal challenge is brought under the Fourteenth Amendment or otherwise, you, it, it's brought by a plaintiff challenging a tribe's ability to do X, Y or Z, right? And the court, 
at least in the wake of Morton versus Mankari, sort of always sees it's an it's another legal fiction in a way, it, but but it's to benefit tribes in in many instances, and that is they 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 shield it from legal challenge by calling it a polit- political as opposed to a racial classification, mm-hmm. even if the classification itself is actually partly racial or partly ancestral, but they call it a political challenge, and you get to insulate it from a from from a lawsuit, right? Or you at least get to prevail. So with our case, there are are indigenous peoples who are not federally recognized that fall really clearly outside of that. You have to be have federal recognition to have the benefit of that classification. For example, this is why in Hawaii, Native Hawaiians have long struggled, toiled, and debated over whether or not to, to try to have a status akin to a federally recognized Indian tribe. But they only want it for purposes of shielding those you know, programs, you know, and like these, these statutes, for example, that um, designate benefits for Native Hawaiians from constitutional challenge. Enter Guam. Guam is like still a UN recognized colony. Our people are colonized. We are awaiting a decolonization re- referendum. And that's what the white plaintiff in, our, in Davis versus Guam challenged. They said to deny him, who I think he's originally from Texas and not colonized, but to, he moves to Guam and he argues um, that to deny him the right to vote in a purely symbolic political status plebiscite. And that is a vote whereby the voter, um, the those who are colonized or descendants of the colonized group get in a voting box and make a symbolic gesture about it, whether or not they want independence, statehood or integration or free association, right? These are internationally recognized options to effectuate self-determination. And then the argument was, the plaintiff argued that this is rate, reverse race discrimination. It's a classic thing, you know, we see it everywhere, but... The court agreed. Federal courts across this country are consistent in one way. They are all consistently accepting that deceptively simple framing of the plaintiff. You know, saying that these indigenous groups um, who are trying to like basically exclude anyone else who's not a part of the colonized polity are violating these, you know, sets of amendments. So this is just, so the court agreed, the Ninth Circuit agreed with, with the lower court, and then the SCOTUS designed, um, denied certiorari. So what that basically means is that right now, at least at this point, the Guam statute authorizing this purely symbolic vote, it's on hold. There is no vote that can be had now. So the, the colonized people, Guam, my people, can't even express a purely symbolic desire, you know, about their future political relationship with the United States. So when you really sort of like take all of these sort, if you take these sort of opinions and the logic that feeds into them to their ultimate conclusion, what you're saying, actually, you're left in a terrible constitutional place where you neither have the protections of a federal recognition that Indian tribes get and get to shield under the political classification doctrine, nor you have the ability to actually even name the group of colonized people you're trying to ask a question because the act of naming them as a colonized group is considered ancestral and then it's considered a racial categorization and there's i don't want to go into it any probably anymore because it's it's a little nuanced about what is an ancestral versus what is a racial classification but suffice it to say that it is the latest sort of iteration um you know of just this this long at this point very long um, historical project of sort of like obliterating the original purpose of those reconstruction amendments. Yeah, no, I mean, there, yeah, no, that was a great explanation. And it, it like lines up perfectly, not perfectly, but there are some similarities in the arguments that non-native adoptee parents um, are having or making against the Indian Child Welfare Act, which is going through, you know, which is on the docket right now at the Supreme Court essentially saying that the Indian Child Welfare Act, which was intended to reverse um, the adoption out or native child removal, um, is a form of reverse discrimination, uh, meaning that it prioritizes a racial group, i.e., you know, uh, American Indians, American Indian families, American Indian relatives, and then uh, American Indian tribes over non-American Indians or non-Indigenous people. Um, and mostly, you know, the, the, the vast majority of these adopted, adopted parents is, are, are white. Um, but not only that, what's interesting about it is that it doesn't, that's actually not how the law operates. And, you know, it's actually like the intention of the law. And some of the parents have actually won their adoption cases 
with the tribes agreeing that they they are the best guardians of these children. And so this whole idea of reverse discrimination is complete bullshit because it's not really about the welfare of the children. At the end of the day, it's it's like kind of what you're pointing at. It's about undermining the kind of legal superstructures that are there to protect tribal sovereignty and integrity, right? Um, and where we, you know, an act of self-determination, whether you want to call it ancestral or not, doesn't matter. We have the right and the authority to determine who belongs to our people. Like that's the number one exercise of sovereignty. And when I was reading, you know, your kind of uh, analysis of this case, it's basically imposing, I mean, this guy's a colonizer. Let's just call him what he is. Like he's not there to integrate into the existing political and cultural order of, uh, you know, uh, Chamorro people who have existed there since time immemorial. He's trying to impose a form and also grossly distorting, um, you know, as you pointed out, Reconstruction era, um, uh, you know, amendments to benefit like his imposition and to also thwart the the will of the popular will of, you know, a colonized people. So, like, I, I thought it was I, I really appreciated like putting that because it, it helped me understand that this isn't just you know, kind of like a continental thing, that this is also happening in the Pacific. Yeah, yeah. And it's ha the thing is, it's happening in the shadows, you know? It's yeah. happening on the margin, the colonial margins. We're so far, you know, away. You know, what, all these cases that happen in not only in Hawaii, but in Guam, in the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, they have to be tracked, even Puerto Rico. You have to track them because these cases, you know, are sort of where all these sort of like, sort of new designs you know, new experiments, you know, in structures are, are happening. They're happening sort of at the colonial periphery. Um, and yeah, and, you know, our stories are really connected. And I think that we have to make common cause they have a way better job, especially legal communities in the different places. Yeah. So they can figure out because the right is very organized. But, you know, in in this regard, actually, they're very, very organized. I mean, I mean even with regard to the insular cases, there's a case in SCOTUS right now about SSI benefits for Puerto Ricans, you know. So it's just a bunch of stuff that we're always having to track. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to take one of your legal courses on reading the insular cases next to like you know Worcester v Georgia or the Marshall mm -hmm. Trilogy Oliphant. there's so many yeah. cases that it's just like and you know that's the thing it's just you know the legal fictions kind of rain down in these cases you kind of like you know it's like you're like oh wow this is what people mean when they say the law is not about justice but it's about <laughs> maximizing order and predictability at least until it's not you know it's like a mm -hmm. very you know it's like like they call it the great game you know but, yeah. so let's Let's turn to um, a piece that you wrote called uh, Birthday Cakes Mean Birthdays, um, which is about this kind of threat of nuclear annihilation. And I think you brought I think you brought up a really good point, you know, just about like the how the withdrawal from Afghanistan may have been a really good thing for in terms of, you know, uh, kind of a decline of the, you know, the or at least in, in um, an end, so to speak of a certain era of militarization but those troops don't just disappear into the mist right as you say you know they're like recolonizing or uh, remilitarizing the pacific but this i think this piece that you that you wrote really talks about this other threat that's looming and i'll just let you uh, i'll let you uh, take it away um sure this one is called birthday cakes mean birthdays escalating tensions between the united states and north korea culminated last week in increasingly specific threats to the island and people of Guam. North Korea announced that Guam was within striking range and that it was seriously examining a plan to launch four intermediate range ballistic rockets toward the island. One headline read 14 minutes, which is the amount of time they say it will take for a missile to reach us. 14 minutes to run for cover, round up our children, reach deep steal ourselves for the possibility of oblivion. We need not worry, our leaders tell us. We are a resilient people. We need only summon that strength now. Will someone please tell them that resilience is not a thing to be trotted out in trying times like a kind of prized pony? As a gifted Haitian-American writer Edwidge Danticat puts it, just because the people are resilient doesn't mean they can suffer more than others. President Trump even phoned the governor of Guam, telling him that he and the country was, quote, with us a thousand percent. 
The conversation devolved from there with our governor in a kind of curtsy saying, Mr. President, quote, I have never felt more safe or so confident than with you at the helm. We need a president like you, end quote. The call lasted all of three minutes with the two going on to talk about the local hotel occupancy rate and the prospect of tourism going up tenfold. Mortifying though it be, it was also oddly intimate, pillow talkish. For its part, Guam Homeland Security released a fact sheet of suggestions on how to prepare for an imminent missile threat, quote, take cover behind anything that might offer protection and quote, lie flat on the ground and cover your head. And this one, for those unfortunate enough to find ourselves outside during the blast, quote, wash your hair with shampoo or soap and water. Do not use conditioner because it will bind radioactive material to your hair. What are we to do with these spectacularly useless suggestions? How can we not be defeated by this kind of extreme stupidity? Why is no one talking about the fact that nuclear war is unlike any other kind of war? Last Wednesday, GOP Senator Lindsey Graham, in an interview with CBS This Morning, assured the American people that even if the Trump administration elects to go to war with North Korea, they should fret not, because at the very least, quote, it's, if there's going to be a war, it's going to be in that, that region, not here in America. And there it is, the kiss of Kissinger. From 1946 to 1958, the U.S. conducted an intensive nuclear testing program just 1,200 miles from Guam in the Marshall Islands, where it detonated 67 atomic and thermonuclear weapons. Of these, a 15 megaton device known as Bravo was the worst. Detonated on March 1, 1954, it deposited life-threatening quantities of radioactive fallout on the Marshallese, some three times the estimated external dose to which the most heavily exposed people living near the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear accident were exposed. They say the radioactive fallout was so thick that many Marshallese, having never seen snow, thought it was snowing. Children played in it. It goes without saying that the nuclear testing program visited unspeakable violence on the Marshallese. The rate of miscarriages in the wake of these tests, for instance, is without parallel. One woman, a dear friend who has long since passed, suffered seven miscarriages in her lifetime. And this is to say nothing of the birth abnormalities that forced Marshallese women to have to devise an entirely new language to describe the things they've seen and the babies they've birthed. For example, jellyfish babies, or babies born without bones and translucent skin. About this program, former NSA and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger had this to say, Quote, there are only 90,000 people out there who gives a damn. If U.S. North Korea relations be complex, this be simple. When you live in a colony, you're easy meat. That was Senator Graham's entire and utterly unoriginal point. But alas, the dogs have been called off. The other day, the Wall Street Journal broke the story that the threat to Guam is gone. Jonathan Chang, writing for the journal, assured us that North Korea has decided not to launch a threatened missile attack on Guam, but, Kim Jong-un warned, North Korea would still consider a strike if, quote, the Yankees persist in their extremely dangerous, reckless actions. The other news outlets quickly followed suit, and in the span of a few short hours, the weather had changed and the world had moved on. Reporters returned to their hotel rooms, sorted their suitcases, and booked their respective flights home. They, have made, they may have made their flights, but they missed the boat. The truth is this. Nuclear weapons do not have to be used to be deadly. As Arundhati Roy says, it would be supreme folly to think so. Nuclear weapons, quote, pervade our thinking. They bury themselves like meat hooks deep in the base of our brains. They are the ultimate colonizer. Truer words were never written. It was my partner's birthday on Sunday. It was mid-afternoon. I was headed to the nearby bakery to pick up a birthday cake. I was frustrated because I couldn't figure out where to put the cake once I picked it up, as my car was already full from the shopping I had done earlier that day. I had decided the day before that it was better to be safe than sorry. And so that morning I went out and bought two weeks worth of supplies canned food, powdered milk, a battery-powered radio, you know, just in case. I was fussing with the bags in the back seat when it hit. Birthday cakes mean birthdays. Another year in the life of a loved one. Life. 
Guam may have to bear the burden of being a colony in a world suffering from decolonization fatigue. But to be clear, her people mean to live. Wow, that's, that's such a great piece. I think um, <laughs> there's a lot to say there, but I think the, you know, the, the first thing that comes to mind is just how I think in average Americans, you know, minds, they don't think of this as the kind of periphery of empire, or they don't even think about the kind of implications of what, you know, war with not just, you know, North Korea, possibly like China actually does to people, you know, and the kind of the ways that it lit, like, it, I think that last scene is very pertinent, where it's like, you don't even have a place to put your birthday cake, your partner's birthday cake, because it's filled with your doomsday prepping of, you know, the threat of like thermonuclear warfare. Um, and then on top of that, the kind of the the other histories, the more recent histories, where the scars of which have not really been erased of, you know, nuclear testing in that region. And there's this really great film called Nuclear Savage. I recommend any, any, anyone who's has the opportunity to check it out. But, you know, one thing that when we was watching the, that film is it really connects, you know, when we talk about you know, nuclear weapons um, or nuclear warfare or even nuclear power, um, there's a disconnect about where that uranium comes from, where those weapons are tested and where the fallout or the spent fuel rods from those uh, reactors are housed. And it's like, all on indigenous land. The most nuked place on the planet is in the Four Corners region and, and on Paiute territory, right? Uh, it's considered wasteland. It was an area in much like these islands were like, oh, it's just in a vast expanse of water. What what could happen, you know? And um, I just, you know, thinking about that in terms of like, what is, you know, whose lives are disposable and what lands uh, or regions or, or biospheres are considered expendable, um, not only just for nuclear weapon, but for the, the energy needs of, of empire. So I really, I mean, I really appreciated that piece. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, that was one of those things, you know, th there's a few pieces in here that were tough, you know, at the time, because obviously the context was that, you know, like I like that, that line about stealing ourselves for the possibility of oblivion, you know, like there's mm -hmm. no way to steal oneself. For that you know that's part of the point you know we are floundering over here again and in someone like all these decisions you know are being made by people we cannot vote for i mean it's also some basic democratic deficiencies at work also you know just like no representation i mean all of it i mean it's just really i don't know i, I sometimes i feel like the injustice is of a scope that you can see from outer space yeah and you know, just thinking about it in terms of what's going on right now. I mean, there was the Red Hill spill in, in Oahu and, you know, the diesel, the diesel fuel that was in this in these underground tanks at this na uh, this naval uh, installation were kind of reserves for, uh, you know, upcoming war games, you know, uh, with the with RIMPAC. Um, and, you know, I, I know a lot about it uh, just because my my friend and comrade, uh, Uhiki Amele, is, has written and taught me a lot about it. Um, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, the militariz like the militarization, like this, you, you spoke a little bit about it earlier, the turn of the pivot to Asia under the Obama administration. But now uh, with the end of the so-called endless wars that uh, Biden has um, inaugurated, there is this return to, you know, China as the threat and like what impacts, you know, you talked about, okay, just, just a, a brief moment in time, it seemed like with uh, heightening tensions between North Korea and the United States, you know, created this immense amount of fear, rightfully so, of uh, nuclear annihilation. And now, but it it's also like looking at like the more immediate and kind of long-term threat of militarization, like, and now it's being intensified with, you know, Biden's rhetoric, uh, you know, anti-Chinese rhetoric and, you know, just growing anti-Chinese sentiment among the amongst the business, as well as the kind of military communities that have oversized influence in the United States. Um, basically, you know, 
we can see what's coming down. It's like seeing like, you know, a train. We can see it so clearly coming down the tracks, you know? And we know what it means because it means the same thing now as it meant yesterday and the day before, you know, and the, and the century before. This is what's happening. Guam and Hawaii are sort of similar in that way. We we are so, you know, obviously Guam more so because it's in closer proximity to this important geopolitical theater, but Hawaii too, just as the sort of center nucleus of the Pacific Command, you know, there and also the joint Marianas here. I mean, so it's already clear. I mean, and it was, it's been clear for like over a decade, but now with the, even the global posture review, you just see all of this. Um, it's the whole world is now shifting and it, there's a consensus in Washington that this is the most important geopolitical theater. They now have, you know, brand new buzzwords like before it was pivot. Now it's pacing, you know, China is America's greatest pacing challenge. And they have to pace their walk according to like how fast China's moving. It is just, just insane sort of like the like interrogating the language that's used too um if that's also quite important but on a, in a in a material way it's hawaiians it's chamorros it's it's us here you know in the region it's the chamorros even of the northern mariana islands we are suffering like they intend to play all kinds of war games on our lands in our seas um they're endangering like thousands of whales i mean not just humpback but all kinds of whales dolphins turtles i mean they it's it's i can't even imagine I, and it's not just that it's it's like everything you know how i started this book with go with the moon right mm -hmm. and how my my godfather like sometimes it, i like i it just stops my heart to think about fishermen now you know, like I, I talk about the Minyahawk, which is a, the baby rabbit fish, you know, and, and, and how we only have seven days. Like fishermen are so, they're grieving now. They're so worried um, they, because that's how the runs are. They're seasonal. They happen very, at very specific times and they time it with the moon. And now it's like different fish, like pelagic fish even. Like they, there's very specific time frames that they have to fish. But the U.S. is building this, again, this massive live fire training range complex over this same Secret site called Latexan or Retidian in the northern coastline of Guam. But they have now extended, without a public hearing, this surface danger zone X amount of miles out toward seaward. It's like a seaward extension of that fake boundary. So now it's like you throw a blanket around that whole area. That is pristine fishing grounds. So many of the fishermen, over 90% of our local fishermen, fish those waters. And now the US military is saying it's going to deny. Uh, fishermen, the ability to be in those waters for two, at least 270 or roughly 273 days out of th a 365 day year. You know, so most of the year they're planning to deny our fishermen. Th and, and it's not like, but that's how empire thinks it's clumsy and huge and doesn't know anything. It's like no conceptual like ability to like stop and hear anything else. And what fishermen are saying is like, we don't care what you're saying. What you're saying makes no fucking sense because we can't, we know what fish are there. We know when they will be there. We, but, and you're saying there's no way to predict that, you know, we know that we're going to be denied. And this is like a lot of subsistence fishing. This is like fishermen who feed their families. I mean, that's another, you know, that's the other thing. That's the cost, you know, of the U S military. And they just take so recklessly everything. I mean, and they, but they also do it without any kind of regard for even their fellow federal agencies, even Fish and Wildlife, even the planning, Nick. It's pretty mind-blowing. Like right now, they're like ripping down like a, a $1 million fence because which was mitigation for like a previous military project. And that was protect um, to protect um, endangered species from ungulates, you know, like feral pigs and deer. And then now they're ripping up that fence. They're going to build another fence here because now they're going to take that forest too. I mean, it's just, and it's constant. And so there's a brown tree snake problem, for example. So what is their solution? They're like in pumping dead mice with Tylenol and dropping them from the sky. Like that, and now because the snakes will eat the mice with laced with the Tylenol, acetaminophen. But my point is, as indigenous peoples, you look at empire, you see everything that's happening. It's like, there is just no, their imagination cannot even possibly understand what we understand. They know nothing of the night sky, as I say. They know nothing of the fish. They know nothing of the moon. They know nothing of anything like that matters to us in terms of our worldview, in terms of what it means to be human on the planet, in terms of, you know, when fish run, you know, like, and they cannot understand. And this is, it's like unintelligible. You know, and so we have to stop them. And the only way to do that is mass mobilization, you know, organizing and organizing across these borders, 
Um, that's why, you know, me and you, you know, in PI, like Progressive International, like that's some of the most exciting work I'm doing just because mm. I, and honestly, Nick, when the farmers won, I mean, just that, just that moment, just that moment when all of those farmers in India, like, you know, you just see their celebrations in the streets, you know, because Modi's terrible farm laws were repealed just for that moment. It was like I was right there with them. That is what Progressive International, that is what we mean by internationalizing our struggle. Not only is it pragmatic, because we have to do it, you know, because empire and corporations, they don't see borders either. They're over, you know, borders like silos, they're all done, you know, so we see that. But when when we have victories, like we should celebrate them with each other. I mean, that's how we build momentum and build hope. We kind of like even celebrate those things together as activists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just a, a final question before yeah. um, we turn uh, to the like the last piece that I wanted you to read from your book. But how do you, I mean, this is kind of a stupid question because I feel like there's a lot of fanfare around something like COP26. And, you know, there's a lot of mobilization and rightfully, rightfully so. But it's almost like you, like you just said, you know, were you talking to the military? Like, how do you, what do you know about the moon? What do you know about the water? What do you know about the fish runs? It seems as if many of the indigenous people who went to COP26, that's what they were saying to these people because they weren't even allowed, you know, they were, you had to sign up, you know, you had to apply for a permit to protest within the whole thing, you know, and it was like, then it became like a protest where everyone was invited, you know, when, when, it, when clearly there are people who are more at fault than others. And, you know, like, I think yeah. there is a tendency to look to these places as venues um, to express one's outrage, but it seems it seems to me, and I, I you know I could be wrong, and I don't want to dismiss you know the incredible work that people do and, and go to these places, but it seems like it's it's a little bit of controlled dissent because it's it's a way to kind of create a pressure valve for people who are just going to go ahead and do whatever the hell they want, anyways. And it's not to sound pessimistic, you know. Well, I, I, I feel like it's just really clear. Like we have to understand exactly what certain venues are going to give us, you know, like, and yeah. if we, like part of what if that is political theater, part of it is having a presence and all, but, but if that's what we believe is actual, like change making, then we're just naive. Like that it cannot possibly be. It's everything that happens all year round. It's not even about that one gathering. It's all the work in communities, the local work in communities across the world. I mean, you know, it's what specific tribes are doing there to block specific pipelines. I mean, in some ways what we're doing, that is what we talk about the big meta narrative, but every pipeline, every specific tribes, you know, exposing a specific pipeline. That's the real work. I mean, it's it's carving down the war into like smaller battles, bite-sized battles, and actually fight, waging them and winning them, you know, one by one. Like, and I know it's it sounds odd because in some ways we have to do everything at once, you know, but that is what we have to do because we're out of time, you know? And I think, I guess what I would say is in some ways though, our communities, I, I, I can't speak for all, you know, just communities, but for me being in community with other people, my own people and other other groups, other peoples. That's what really gives me hope. Nothing that's happening at Quat, COP, nothing about those negotiation rooms, nothing about that. Like, like as long as I'm in conversation with our own people, like, I mean, then I feel completely more hopeful. I feel always more hopeful when I'm with, in community with our other people, the humble people of the earth. Mm -hmm. The humble people of the earth. That is our audience, you know, like that has always been, I mean, you know, and it has to be because otherwise it's not true. You know, because everything's like a fair weather friend. Every leftist politician, even, you know, the squad or whoever, you know what I mean? Like, you know, they, they, it's, they still live in a world of shadows and in a world of game playing, you know, in some ways. And they, they, they'll they vote not with the Iron Dome and then they'll get this other thing. I mean, it's just like, you know, and I can't track that and I can't use my time doing that. And so many of us don't because it's so disheartening. So, but when we're with our own people and we're like, you know, and we're like, and we, we, it's, I know this sounds weird, Nick, but it's intimacy. Mm. Honestly, if I, if I didn't feel intimate about, if there was no intimacy, there would be no hope. You know, but when you're with people in community and it's real and you care very much about each other's victories and you're invested in them, then it makes a huge difference, you know? Yeah, 100%. And, you know, it was the, the, the COP26 stuff when I was thinking about it. 
you know, I was thinking about, yeah, there's there's an expression there. That obviously, there's you have to stage a protest there. You have to because it's where they're gathering, you know. But at the same time, like you just said, like the most effective movements, like if you look at the Indigenous Environmental Network report that came out right before COP26 around um, the carbon infrastructure in Canada, the United States and carbon emissions, it found that, you know, Indigenous people uh, were challenging about a quarter of the carbon emissions from both Canada and the United States. And those were localized kind of grassroots struggles. They weren't all pipeline protests. Some of them were. Some of them were, you know, uh, legal and political battles that were waged um, or still being waged. And so there is, you know, like you said, I like that where you, it's like you have to break it down into like manageable pieces and fights and understand that like even in even in that, you know, even though they're small fights, it's like the one big fight, like you said, like we're all in struggle together. And I think, yeah, no. I... Oh, we also have gifts, you know, some of us have mm -hmm. really specific gifts, you know, and talents and abilities. Like, for example, it excites me when you have like young indigenous legal talent and you're at, and they're like, they've carved out like an even smaller part of that. That is to chase down those damn ALEC bills, you know, to really oh, all yeah. the bills that are seeking to criminalize dissent and the right to, you know, assembly and to protest the extractive injury, like pipeline, like all of that, stopping all of those laws at both the state and the federal level. That's a hugely important thing that we need to do, you know, because we know what the right is doing. It's criminalizing all of this. Indigenous caretaking is what we call it, but they call it, you know, criminal activity. So that is a particular example of what, you know, like it's exciting when you see young indigenous legal talent working on it. Mm -hmm. And just before I let you go, I want I want to um, ask you to read one final piece. Um, uh, we don't need scientists, uh, if, you, if you will. Thanks, Nick. Um, this is just a short um, poem called We Have No Need for Scientists. We have no need for scientists to tell us things we already know, like the sea is rising and the water is getting warm. The inundated need no instruction in inundation. We have, uh, we have eyes of our own, and besides, we are busy scraping barnacles off our grandfather's graves and other headstones drowned at high tide. We know how critical it is our coral reefs stay healthy and our mangrove forests dense. We will defend them to the end, not because some study shows they provide protection from erosion or shelter from storms, but because our reefs are adoring aunts feeding other people's children and our mangroves mothers in their own right. Well, thank you so much, Julian, for joining us today. Um, where can people find your work and where can people buy the new version of the book? Uh, sure. Thanks, Nick. Um, so basically, we've sold the book um, to Astro House in New York. And so it will be coming out next year. Um, no, this year. Sorry, we're in 2022 now. It'll be coming out later this year, but under a new title, um, under the title No Country for Eight Spot Butterflies. Mm. Yeah. Perfect. And where can people find your work on social media or uh, sure. uh, websites? Me on, well, yeah, I have an author website, julianuggin.com and I'm on Twitter. I think my handle is my name and there might be an underscore, but yeah. yeah um, yeah. Julian I, uh, again. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Um, so yeah, no, thank you so much, Nick, for just getting the word out, not only about the book, but just about the movement, you know, and the, the things that we're doing here in the islands. So I appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. Thanks so much again for joining us.